tonight. Amen. And I tell you, I hope you are. Boy, I tell you, you find out in life that when you think you, we've all heard the old statement that God won't put more on you than he, you can handle. That's not true. What is true is God won't put more on you than you and him together can not handle. But I'll tell you, sometimes he puts us in those places where we don't know if we're holding on or not. Amen. But thank God he's holding on to us. Amen. Great to see you all tonight. Uh, Brother William, run up here if you will. I've asked Brother William to open the service tonight in prayer. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing what God's going to do. Don't forget, Brother Money will say more about it. But next Sunday kicks off our refresh conference. Brother Scott Matthews and the Matthews family will be with us singing all day Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And then, of course, uh, Monday night and Tuesday night, Brother Joe Arthur will be here. And uh, we're, of course, uh, looking forward to that. I know it's going to be a great, great time in the Lord. Brother William, come if you will and open us in prayer tonight. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you created, Lord. We thank you for the message brought forth this morning, dear Lord. We pray that you be with Pastor Jenkins, Lord, who delivers a message to us tonight, dear Lord. We pray anyone lost here today come to as your personal Savior. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for everything you do. Please be with us next week with our refreshed conference, dear Lord, and also the share coming up, dear Lord. Yeah. Please be with the workers, dear Lord. We just pray that uh, pledges come in, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for everything you do. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
There is power in the blood. Page number 23 in your hymn book. church tonight looking forward to what God has in store for us this evening don't forget there's two meetings right after the service tonight share meeting all that are involved in the share Wednesday through Saturday this week there's a meeting right after the service with brother Matt and then also there's a 5k race meeting this evening after the service so right after the share meeting we need all the help we can get you'll have to stick around for that meeting with brother Heiss and then Ladies Night Out is this coming Tuesday, new ministry. We're kicking off April 16th, Tuesday at 6.30. It says bring a passing salad to share, fun night for all ladies, of, all ladies and for our teen girls. So looking forward to you being part of that. And then also share is this coming Wednesday, a new format, Wednesday through Saturday. And I pray you'd be much in prayer for the share You'd be in prayer that you would listen, that you could help and work and minister in that ministry, and then also, uh, if you can, work on the phones and answer phones. I know Brother Matt still needs probably a few more people if you'd see him tonight during that meeting, and then my next Sunday, what a special time we have, and Brother Matthews and his family will be with us on Sunday, and then Brother Joe Arthur here Monday night and Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, no Wednesday night service the following week, that's not this week, the following week. So looking forward to what God has in store for us. And uh, my, we need refreshing. We might say we don't, but we need refreshing all the time. Ushers, come forward. Let's take our Sunday evening offering. Again, thank you for being here and honoring us with your presence. And let's worship the Lord together in spirit and in song. Ms. Skyler, pray for the offering. together. It may be the last time we gather as a church. You could be calling us home today. Lord, what a blessing that would be. Lord, I pray that you would bless and help us in this hour to focus on you, focus on your word, and to focus on these end times that we are definitely living out completely. Lord, we love you tonight. I pray that you bless this offering. Meet the ministries here and abroad as we have the privilege to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Beginner Bible time will be dismissed right after the special. This song is not a song that I necessarily want to sing. 
Restore the joy. A lot of events have happened lately. They kind of meet at an intersection. The prophetic chapter of Revelation, the churches, all these things the preacher are talking about, the state of our church, the state of his church, the state of every heart that's as his child, the state of my heart. I've been fighting with the Lord for a long time on this side. But revival is coming, at least on the sheet of paper. And it's time to get real. Are we a missionary? song but it's a very truthful song once I
but now my words are cold joy is gone the beginner Bible hour. Boys and girls can slip out now and uh, ushers. We want to get our Bible study guides at everyone's hands tonight. Uh, most of you probably already have a study guide, but I suspect there might be some that do not have yours with you, or maybe this is your first time with us. Just slip your hand up and uh, the ushers will see your hand and get you a study guide. Let's turn while uh, we're awaiting that to Revelation chapter 2 tonight. We're going to pick up right where we left off last Sunday night. Revelation chapter 2, we're going to be looking again tonight at the church age and the churches. Uh, Pastor Ennis actually wrote a book about the seven churches. Uh, Preacher, what was the name, what's the name of your book about the seven churches? Seven Churches of Asia Minor. Seven Churches of Asia Minor. The, uh, I've got a copy in my office, that's a good book. If you've never gotten a copy of that, you ought to get hold of the preacher and get a copy of that. It's a great uh, study, and we're not doing the in-depth uh, justice to it that he did in his book, of course. This is, uh, we're in a couple of Sunday nights looking through the entire book of Revelation in our Perilous Times chart. We, of course, have been in First Timothy, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter 3 throughout the uh, uh, series, and we're going to return there for our final study at the end of that great chapter. But we are, at this portion of our study, we are looking at the prophetic chart of end time events, looking at a synopsis of the book of Revelation. And, of course, uh, at the very top of your study guide, you see that uh, first diamond. We have listed the key events of the prophetic calendar. We said number one is the rapture of his church, and that's going to take uh, uh, his church to be with him, 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, we saw the second event is the tribulation period in a time of unrestrained evil. The third event, of course, is the second coming of Christ where he will return to judge the world. And then, of course, the fourth uh, uh, element or the uh, event in the prophetic calendar is the millennial reign of Christ. The millennium, of course, is that thousand years where he will rule the world. And uh, what an a, a awesome, awesome uh, thought that uh, period in history is going to be. It's in the future now. It will be a part of history one day when for 1,000 years uh, the uh, righteousness will rule and reign in this world. And then, of course, Revelations chapter 21 and 22 deals with the final portion of prophecy, and that is a new heaven 
and a new earth. But what we're doing uh, in our study tonight, we are uh, seeing a breakdown uh, of the book of Revelation. And we are tonight, chapter number one, two, and three, we are in what we call the church age. And that's uh, where we find ourselves tonight. Chapter one, of course, is the introduction. And uh, chapter number two and chapter three, we see the seven churches of Asia Minor presented to us. Now, I want to just uh, remind everyone again tonight, there are two ways that the seven churches of Asia Minor are studied and understood. Of course, and without uh, the uh, uh, any debate whatsoever, they are literal uh, uh, local congregations there in the early hour of the church of uh, the uh, age. Uh, any map you look at, you Google search. Uh, I actually tried to get a map I was going to put up tonight, but my email was messed up on my computer and it ain't working, so I couldn't get it up to the PA booth tonight. But the uh, uh, the seven churches of Asia Minor, of course, are all in what we would call today modern Turkey. And uh, these were seven literal congregations that existed in uh, the early days of the church age. And uh, we're looking at these churches tonight. Every one of them is a local literal congregation. The word ecclesia, which is our Greek word that we get uh, the word church from, literally means a called out assembly. Now there's a false teaching that's common in our world today uh, called the doctrine or the teaching of the universal church. The idea meaning that you can actually be in the church without being in the church. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a member of any local church. I'm part of the universal church. And uh, here's the problem with that. There is no universal church in the world today. Say there's not. What do you mean, preacher? The word church means called out assembly. We will be a universal church when the trumpet sounds. Because we'll be called out of this world. But tonight, if you plan on being a part of the church, you need to find one with an address and get involved in it. Amen? Uh, the, which I know you all are tonight. But the uh, that is obviously the first and clear teaching of Revelations 2 and 3. These are se seven literal churches who get a message from Jesus Christ about their condition. But they are also understood, and this part is a little more fascinating, they are also uh, understood to represent seven different ages in the what we call the church age. And we began, we won't reteach them tonight, but we began last week in chapter 2. We looked at verse 1 through 7 at the church at Ephesus. This is called the loveless church. This is a church that has not lost but the Bible says, Brother Charles, they left their first love. The command given to them was to return to their first works. You, you, I've learned this. You often find something where you lost it. Did you catch that? See, I, I, something happened a year ago in my Christian life, preacher. I don't know what it is. Well, if you go back there, I bet you'll find out what happened a year ago in your Christian life if it got off the rails. Uh, it's the loveless church. And this, uh, uh, by the, uh, the church, uh, the uh, age calendar would represent the early church. It would represent uh, the, uh, from the very beginning of the uh, church uh, uh, up until probably uh, the latter part of the first century. And uh, ironically, and it's an amazing thought uh, when the this church loses its first love or left rather its first love in the beginning of the apostolic age the uh, we think about this tonight uh, just because something starts right don't mean it's going to end right you know we have a terrible human tendency to get in cruise control y'all ever notice that we have a terrible human tendency uh, to uh, get in a comfort zone and I've learned in my Christian life, you've heard me say this before, oftentimes the comfort zone's not even comfortable. But it's what we've always done. It's the rut we're in. Someone said a rut is a grave with two ends knocked out. I don't want my Christian life to be a rut. I don't want my Christian life uh, to get uh, callous. But the way we prevent that is we got to stay on fire for God. We got to stay right with God. We got to stay connected. The uh, If tonight, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if we could put a meter up here tonight, and uh, on this side of the meter, the zero is just stone cold dead. And over here on this side of the meter, up at the 10, is just wide open, red hot, I mean on fire for God. If we could plug all of us into that meter tonight, I wonder where your arrow would be. 
Would it be, well, I'm just, I, I'm, not, I'm not totally away from the Lord preacher, but I've lost ground. Or would it be, you know, bless God, I'm, I'm, I'm no uh, worse than anybody else. <laughs> Ain't no better than anybody else either. I'm just about average. I don't know about you. I never was happy with average. Uh, you know what average is? Average is the top of the bottom and the bottom of the top. Uh, you're, you're, the, you're the smartest of the flunkies and the dumbest of the smart people. Amen. I don't want to be in the middle. I want to be all the way. And we won't preach this tonight. But he actually says to the church at Laodicea, I would that you were cold or hot. Isn't that a fascinating thought? God said, I'd rather you be completely dead than to be lukewarm. Now, I'm not preaching that right now. That's in a couple of, couple of verses. Amen. But uh, this church, the early church, uh, the, uh, the church at Ephesus was the loveless church. We learned last Sunday night in chapter 2, verse 8 through 11, that the church at Smyrna was the suffering church. It's the only church that receives no criticism at all from the Lord. But uh, the, uh, I didn't deal with this last Sunday night, and I won't do much with it tonight, other than to clarify it's not just suffering, but it's suffering because of persecution. You know, we have this terrible mindset in our 21st century uh, mind that uh, if somebody's having a tough time, they must be getting judged for something. If somebody's having a tough time, they must be, you know, reaping what they've sown. And there's certainly a possibility that that's the case. But it's also possible that you're a church at Smyrna and you've just been doing right and you've been getting the, 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 your daylights knocked out of you. And uh, the Lord never criticizes a people that are being persecuted. Well, I think we do some good tonight to do the same. The, and then we ended last Sunday night in chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, looking at the church at Pergamos. This is the church at Satan's seat. It's the worldly church. It's the compromising church. It's the church that tried to blend the world with the church. And I don't want to get on a rabbit trail tonight, but we've sure seen that manifest itself in the day and age which we live. The, uh, this church, of course, would represent the early 300s. And uh, let's dive in tonight. Let's look at chapter number 2, verse 18, as we look tonight at the next church, and that is the church at Thyatira. Uh, the, uh, this is a very interesting letter this church receives. Pick up verse 18, if you will. Under the angel of the church in Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes the uh, like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Notice what he says, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. But notice this next phrase in verse 20, notwithstanding I have a what? few things against thee. I don't want God to say that to me, to you. I have a few things against thee. In almost every church, the list is one thing. They get more than one on their list. Notice what he says about this church. Uh, he says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Now, if I'm going to offend you tonight, this will probably be where I'm going to do it. Amen. Jezebel is not talking about literally a woman, but it's talking about a church. It's actually almost every conservative Bible scholar I've ever read believes this represents Roman Catholicism. This represents the era that Romanism became uh, the, uh, the power force in the church age. The, uh, this, by the way, uh, this time frame uh, would go all the way from the mid-300s all the way to the 15 to 1600 reigns. The largest section of the church age is this uh, section. And if you know anything about Western civilization, you know this is also called the Dark Ages. And what has caused that darkness, and this is scary, what has caused that darkness is this woman Jezebel. Now listen, there's no kind of lost any worse than religious lost. Can I say that again? There's no kind of evil worse than religious evil. We've seen it all over our world in the last 20, 25 years. The atrocities done in the name of religion. I mean, to think that uh, commercial airliners would be hijacked and ran into buildings and kill thousands here in our nation, and it was all done in the name of religion. 
It was all done in the, uh, the uh, you know, the very thing tonight. Uh, the, as we're all concerned for the nation of Israel, this attack uh, last night, uh, the uh, all done in the name of religion. And, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, if you'll study it closely, you'll be surprised that the most atrocious wars in history were religious wars. This is all played out in front of us tonight. Now, notice uh, with this mindset that Jezebel is, is actually a church. Notice it says, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrifice unto, what's the next word, unto what? Idols. Without trying to hurt our Catholic friends tonight, the uh, Romanism is synonymous with idolatry. You won't go into any Catholic anything without seeing shrines and statues. Uh, the, uh, I know even in some Christian circles, and by Christian I mean Bible-believing circles, you'll see some statuary. And I say, uh, just my personal view of the Bible, we ought not have any statuaries in Bible-believing churches. You know, as much as we love Dr. Ennis, we ain't building no statue to him here, and he wouldn't let us. Because you know what will happen, a couple generations will come down the road, they won't know that it was just to say thank you. They'll start thinking, that's got something to do with God, and they'll start worshiping it. The Bible literally says, no graven images. Now, stay with me. It's interesting that it's a female. Now, most of us didn't grow up in Catholicism, so we can't understand this or appreciate this. But Mary's almost more important in Catholicism than Jesus is. As a matter of fact, she's the one that does the interceding. And the idea is, boy, if you need to get a hold of the son, if you get a hold of his mama, she'll get a hold of him for you. Now, folks, listen to me. Mary deserves an elevated place in our, in our, our memories. And the Bible certainly calls her blessed. But listen, she needed to be saved just like every other sinner that's ever lived. She was at the early church's first prayer meeting in Acts chapter 2, or 3 rather, or Acts chapter 1 rather. She's there praying like everyone else. Why? Because she ain't got no more access to Jesus than you do. Right. We don't pray in Mary's name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You remember one day they even came to Jesus and said, hey, your mother and brethren are without. And he didn't even recognize them. He said, my, my family, my brothers, my sisters. He said, those are the ones that hear my word and do it. Jesus, while he loved his mother, never deified her. There, there, is no, there is no immaculate conception in the sense that the one doing the conceiving was sinless. Are you all with me tonight? But the idea of the feminine description of this religious order here is because of that false idolatry. He says in verse 21, I gave her space to repent for her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, I'm not going to get on a rabbit trail here tonight, but for all of my lifetime, some of you that are older than me maybe remember an era that this was not the case. But from my lifetime in the last 60 years, uh, uh, we've had this word introduced to us called ecumenicalism. And what ecumenicalism really means is, is that we emphasize common ground at the expense of doctrine. Now listen, I think we ought to get along with each other. Paul wrote, as much as life in you dwell peace with all men, but there are some things we cannot fellowship if we don't deal with these things. You know, in all my years of pastoring, and I know Dr. Ennis never did either, I've never been a part of any ministerial association in the community. And uh, I'm for, like, preachers, fellowships. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where every denomination gets together. And every denomination treats each other. Well, now, we ought to be nice to people, whether they're saved or lost. But we ought not all get together and act like everybody believes the same thing when we don't believe the same thing. That's what ecumenicism is. And uh, the, uh, what, it, what is happening here, and I, I'm being careful tonight. I don't want to get too deep into this and offend anybody. Y'all can tell I'm really upset about that, ain't you? <laughs> but God likens those that yoke up with her to committing fornication. Yes, sir. I mean, he uses a sexual metaphor in 
you'll study all throughout the Old Testament and he likens the nation of Israel leaving the God of the Bible and going after the gods of the nations that they were to displace in Palestine. He calls that chasing false gods. God calls that idolatry, but he also calls it adultery. Are you with me tonight? It's a serious thing to turn on God. We've got this movement today of second and third generation Christians who are saying they have deconstructed their faith. And that's fancy term for saying they've turned into an atheist. Can I tell you something tonight? There aren't no atheists in this world. Everybody has faith. The issue just is what your faith is in. And if we're not careful... We can play around with that stuff. You may have been hurt. You may have been offended. Somebody may have, may have uh, uh, wronged you. I'm not making light of any of that tonight. But don't be messing around with this stuff. You'll walk right into, you'll, you'll get you a ticket straight to hell. You'll get messing around with this stuff. And before you know it, you're believing stuff that's absolutely, in the eyes of God, idolatry and spiritual adultery. Hey, I still fear God. I've been upset. I've been, I've been sideways more than once, Brother Mike, in my Christian journey. But I never gave up on God because Christians let me down. Amen. I never reevaluated the Bible because some people that preached it didn't live it like they preached it. Amen. Hey, why is God in trouble? Because people have let you down. Yeah, that's good. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. I beg you, young people listen to the preacher tonight. Stay right with God. Amen. Stay in church. Stay, stay with the old-time religion. Don't, don't veer off. Hey, listen, uh, there's so many that think it ain't no big deal. It, it may be a heaven or hell situation. That's a pretty big deal to me. I don't know about you. The, uh, notice what he says next. This is intense, verse 23. And I will what her children? Kill her children. Now, again, I'm trying to be sweet tonight. This is always the church when you deal with it, you have to be careful you don't offend everybody. But her children are Protestants. Can I tell you something tonight? I don't have time to get into this in depth tonight, but we ain't Protestants. Amen. Amen. Nowhere in my family tree, Brother Mike, does it lead back to Rome. That's right. You study the early church. There has been, since the days Christ and his disciples walked the earth, there's been a group of believers that believe what we believe tonight. Now, they weren't always organized in the level we are, and they didn't always have our name. But groups like the Waldenese, some of these early, uh, the, uh, they far predated Roman Catholicism. Matter of fact, if you'll study a good Catholic uh, theologian's history line, they'll admit to you, oh, there was always a group of people that never yoked up with us. It didn't come from us, never had nothing to do with us. Matter of fact, most of our persecution in the early ages of the church age was from Catholicism. Because we, matter of fact, our name that we hold tonight, Baptist, we didn't really name ourselves. Much like the early Christians, Acts 11 says that the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The early believers didn't call themselves Christians. The world called them that. That meant Christ-like ones. And our, our, our uh, Catholic, the, uh, uh, the uh, historians tell us the Catholic Church uh, got aggravated at this uh, little ragtag group of believers that told people that because you was baptized as a baby don't mean nothing. Right. You'll split hell wide open, soaking wet or dry. It won't make no difference. You don't go to heaven because you got baptized as a baby. You got to get saved to go to heaven. And baptism doesn't happen before salvation. It happens after salvation. No one can make that decision for you. You've got to make it for yourself. Right. I've asked many Catholic people about their baptism. And they say, well, I don't know nothing about it. I was a baby. Well, if you don't know nothing about it, it didn't count. Right. Now, hey, listen. I got good news for you. Babies that die don't go to hell. God doesn't hold anybody accountable for sin that doesn't yet hasn't reached an age of accountability or understanding. You don't got to baptize your baby to keep him from going to hell. God's too just. He wouldn't send a, an innocent child to hell that didn't understand right from wrong. Amen. But of course, our forefathers, because we baptized people after salvation, even though they'd been baptized as babies, named our forefathers the Anabaptist, which means the rebaptizers. 
And uh, we've been their favorite people ever since. Amen. But think about this tonight. He's talking. Now, this age, this, there's a literal church called Thyatira, but the age that he's identifying here tonight would put this at the exact time frame of the start in the expansion of Roman Catholicism and the Protestant Reformation. And he says about her children, God says, I'm, I'm going to turn out the lights on them. And all the churches shall know, he said, that I am he which searches the reins and hearts and will give unto every one of you according to your works. Both unto you, I say, and unto the uh, arrest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth the words uh, works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. This, of course, is such a dark hour in the church age as well as a tragic story of this church at Thyatira. Then notice, if you will, let's flip over to chapter 3. Let me just begin to read. Chapter 3, we see the fifth church that receives this letter from Jesus. This is called the church at Sardis. Well, this one uh, burdens me. And by the way, this church is the church in the chronological of uh, the uh, interpretation from the 1500s to about the 1800s. It would really describe the Protestant Reformation. Methodism, Lutheranism, and all those, those groups, Presbyterianism. The, uh, notice what it says to this church and to this literal church at Sardis. He said, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, saith uh, the, uh, he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. Here it is. That thou hast a what? Say it with me out loud. A what? A name. So they're living off their reputation. Thou hast a name that thou what? Livest, but what did he say about him? But this is the truth. He said, thou art what? Dead. dead. They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead at 3 o'clock in the morning. Notice he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not, uh, thee not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt know the what hour shall not know what hour I will come uh, upon thee. And thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, that have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, let me make sure you catch this. Well, I do appreciate and I do put great value on the chronological church age timeline of each of these churches. I can't help but look at this church. And really see the greatest dispensation, the greatest understanding, the greatest illumination from this church is seeing it as a local congregation. Can you imagine like the Holy Spirit coming into our midst and saying, y'all got a reputation, you're alive, but the truth is you're dead. You say, what would make him say that preacher to this church? Here's what he was talking about. And boy, this is so serious, Brother Rob. They had good orthodoxy that means they believed the right thing their doctrinal statement passed the test you know what's happened to our movement by that I mean our kind of Baptist you ain't gonna find no better doctrinal statement most of our kind of churches have good music standards. Most of our kind of churches have good modesty standards. Most of our kind of churches have the right Bible. I'm talking about the old King James Bible. Thou hast a name that thou livest. Well, that's a good church. Man, they're independent, separated, fundamental Baptist. Now, all of that's good and all that's important to me, as I hope it is to you. But here's what he said. He said, but you're not alive, you're dead. Is there a verse that d describes this? Oh, actually there is. Church, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. The last phrase of that verse says, the letter what? Killeth. But the Spirit giveth what? Life. 
You know what this church is? This is a church that's proud. We ain't as bad as them folks over there. Bless God, we don't, we don't cuss, we don't chew, we don't run with them that do. Man, we're separatists. We're old-time religion. I say amen to all that as long as you don't think that proves you're alive. That just proves on your death certificate that you once were alive. This is so, I, I, I almost feel like stop teaching and start doing some preaching right here. We've got such a false, I mean, there's just no simple way to say it. It's just flat out demonic deception. Yes, sir. Many Christians think, Brother David, because they've been saved for so many decades that somehow seniority makes you and I right with God. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings tonight, but if you can dot every Baptist I and cross every Baptist T and you know the doctrines. I mean, you you can you know the chapter references by heart. I mean, you got it all down. But it's been a long time since you shed a tear. It's been a long time since you run an altar and tried to get closer to God. It's been a long time since your heart of the you literally ached when you saw a sinner who needed Christ and didn't want to get saved. And listen, my friend, if you've gotten so, you got it all right. But it's been a long time since there's been any evidence of life in you well I'd be running to this altar regardless of whether the Bible format we're learning tonight is teaching Amen. hey I'm fully convinced brother Charles a lot of God's people tonight who are doctrinally straight on think they're alive and God says you're dead Amen. God says you're dead hey I'll tell you what is I'm getting older. This is such a burden of mine. I've even talked about it in the last few services. Man, I do not want to get to this place that I just start worrying about. You know, we've got, got to have enough money in the bank. You never know what could happen. And we go into maintenance and conservation mode and stop waking up every day excited and focused and fired up about serving God. You might be in your late 70s, early 80s and don't have the energy you once had. But bless God, please tell me there's still a pulse there. Amen. Man, Miss Joy, I heard her heart tonight. She didn't just sing tonight. She testified. Amen. Man, as she was singing, I was thinking, God have mercy. Why'd Miss Joy write a song about me? Is that what you got from that song? That's what I got from that song. Yes, sir. I got convicted. Amen. I got challenged. I remember, man, when uh, the uh, uh, my early Christian days, man. I, I mean, uh, the uh, I got, I started shouting when I walked in the building. I mean, I got excited when the song leader said, "Stand to your feet." I mean, I got, man, when it was time for the offering, man, I got excited. I mean, I was just alive in every aspect of my Christian life. And here I've been saved now over four decades. I know my doctrine. I'm not being arrogant, but I, I probably could. Debate just about anybody on about any subject and hold my own. I know where I'm at on the doctrine of soteriology, Brother Mike. I know where I'm at on the uh, doctrine of bibliology. I know where I'm at on the uh, doctrine. Hey, you name it. I... But it don't matter how good you can quote Scripture. What matters is are you living Scripture? Amen. Hey, listen. First thing they do when they come upon an accident or a person that they're not sure is alive is they check for a pulse and you know what else they do brother hunter they try to see if there's any breath coming out of this person Amen. you know breath is symbolic of in the bible don't you it's talking about the holy ghost i don't care how bad things are if people get around you and i say ain't no doubt he's alive buddy Amen. there's the holy ghost coming out of him still Ain't no doubt. His, his heart's still beat, man. You, 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 you put your hand here on his wrist, put it on your wrist. You mentioned the King James Bible, and his, his, his pace picks up. <laughs> you mentioned soul winning, and it, it picks up, man. His beat starts going faster. There's somebody in there still. He's still there. Amen. That's good. Thou hast the name that thou livest. Can I beg you not, child God, quit living off of yesterday? Quit starting every sentence by I used to. Quit every conversation you have be about something that happened yesterday. Hey, I don't know about you. I plan on, I plan on living till I die. Amen. 
I, I know a lot of people, Brother Money, they died about 10 years before they, before they quit living. Because now all they talk about is what used to happen. No focus about tomorrow. You say, well, preacher, I got the energy that I, I, I had for yesterday, for tomorrow. God's not asking you to have the energy that you had when you was 20, 30, 40 years old, when you're 60, 70, 80, 80. But what God wants you to do is live every day for Jesus. Hey, I'll tell you what, I, the longer I live, Brother Terry, I, I'm fully convinced I'm one of the greatest attributes of life is surviving. I used to think it was accomplishing. Now it's surviving. Man, when somebody's still going, man, I get excited. You mean to tell me you've been saved 60 years and you still pray every day? You mean to tell me you've been saved 65 years and you still shed a tear when you see how good the Lord's been to you and how, how much grace and mercy it's taken? Hey, listen, you don't got to be Charles Atlas to have evidence that you're alive. It's so simple. It's Here it is. Your Christian life is not measured how long you've been in it it's measured by the direction you're going today y'all with me remember when the Jews crossed that Red Sea that's a picture of salvation they get all the way over to the Jordan River they're ready to turn, go into the land they send those spies in and the spies come back with some bad news they said, everything God said about it's true. It is a land that flows milk and honey. It is a, it, there are grapes that are the size of baseballs. Amen. They said, but they said, there's people that live over there that think it's theirs. And we even, some of them are giants. Hey, no way we can do this. And that report they gave, God called it an evil report. Well, Brother Joshua and Caleb said, can I say a word? And they encourage God's people to ignore these ten doubters, these ten grasshoppers. Let's go. God said it. We can do it. We can do it. The victorious Christian life is not a land without battles. It's just a land without defeat. He didn't say, I'm going to give it to you. He said, I'm going to help you conquer the land. Amen. I just... And finishing up right now my Bible reading, the book of Joshua, and I always love getting to that chapter where it says, Now there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. Yeah. Amen. And you read the next few chapters, seven of the tribes, they've got they've conquered the whole land. They've conquered every king, and seven of the tribes ain't got no land yet. And Joshua's saying, Boys, go get it. We've conquered it, but you, you have to do something. Get off your duff and at least get you a ruler, a yardstick, and go out and at least measure where you want your place. Amen. Hey, listen. The evidence you're still right with God is not that you've been saved longer than me. It's that you're still in, on fire for God. You still love the Lord. You're still growing. Amen. But you remember what they said when they got that report. They voted not to go forward. And then they made this crazy statement. It would have been better for us if we had died in Egypt. Where did that idea come from? See, what they've actually said, for, from the minute they crossed the Red Sea, they've been heading this way. They're way over here, but now while they're here, their hearts are headed back that way. See, it isn't how long you've been saved, it's the direction you're going that tells you and I tonight whether or not we're dead or we're alive. I got to hurry tonight. Notice the next church, verse number 7. This is the church at Philadelphia. It says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the keys of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I love verse 8, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. If God opens a door, nobody can shut it in your life. But what the devil will do, he'll try to keep you from walking through it. He says, for thou hast a little strength. And has kept my word, has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. I love this verse. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. 
which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Uh, thee hold fast which, uh, that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. This church is called the faithful church. The church at Thyatira is the adulterous church. The church at Sardis, the dead church. But the church at Philadelphia is the faithful church. It's the serving church. Oh, I don't know about you tonight. I want to be faithful, don't you? I may not be the most talented in the room, but I can be faithful. I may not have the most ability in the room, but I can be faithful. A wise man once said that dependability is the greatest ability. You know, I, I don't, I, I think we, I want to say this carefully tonight, but I think we, we sometimes overemphasize talent. Now, this is my opinion. I'm not preaching right now. I'm just testifying. I'm for talent. I'm for people that are good at what they do, getting a chance to bless our hearts. But I'll tell you what I really want to be around. I want to be around faithful people. I want to be around people that, boy, Sunday morning, Sunday night, you ain't no reason to go by visit them. ain't going to be home. Because every Sunday night of the world, buddy, bless God, they're, they're behind sitting in the pew in the local church. Brother Terry, my kids never asked me one time in my entire memory, Dad, are we going to church today? That, that, was, that was, would have been an unknown concept at our church, at our family. Amen. It don't make us better than anybody else. We just decided to be faithful. Amen. Brother Ken, I, I, I'm not bragging tonight, but I'm, I'm, ex, I'm still excited I can tell you this tonight. I've been faithful even though sometimes I don't want to be. You ever get aggravated at people at church? I'm sure you never have. It's really a blessing when the pastor is the people you're aggravated at at church. But Brother David, I can't, I can't go back in my memory and remember one service I laid out of church because I was mad at somebody else. Not one time I laid out of church because the preacher hurt my feelings and bless God, I was going to discipline him, but I was showing up for a couple of weeks. You ain't disciplining him. You're just showing everybody around you that if you don't get your way, you take your toys and go home. Hey, listen, your faithfulness isn't proven when it's easy to be faithful, it's proven when it's hard to be faithful. Yeah. Hey, I don't know about you tonight. I want to be faithful. Let's look at the last church. This is the one that maybe is the most famous in this great chapter. And boy, it, it just it gets on in verse 14. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. I've always been fascinated by that. God said, I'd rather you be stone dead than to be halfway in on anything. Amen. If you know anything about chemistry, you know this. Freezing cold kills the germs. And scalding hot kills the germs. But they thrive in lukewarm. You show me a lukewarm Christian tonight. You show me a lukewarm church tonight. And I'll show you a church the devil's making. He's having hay with making a mess out of your situation. Mom and dad, and I'm not being ugly tonight. I'm just telling you what I believe the book is trying to say to us tonight. We are killing our kids by this half in, half out Christianity. I know I'm going to make some enemies right here. But I am, am not proud. I'm not being arrogant. I'm not being condescending tonight. But one of the greatest decisions Debbie and I ever made when our kids were growing up is we didn't have a television in our home. And I knew that would get quiet. But my problem wasn't that I was holier than everyone else. I didn't have one because I wasn't holy enough. I, I was having a hard enough time directing my kids, let alone having help from Hollywood to mess them up. I never sent them to a public school, and I never... We, and I, I guess I should qualify. We had a television set in our home. It just wasn't hooked up to nothing. And this wasn't in the days of smart TVs and internet. There, there wasn't no internet. I hate to tell you how old I am. There wasn't no internet back then. Hey, hey, listen. If we watched a movie, it was something like Sheffy. Or if we really got out there on the limb and got whirly, we'd go rent us old Yeller. My kids wore out old Yeller. I mean, flat out wore out. I, I still remember the VCR tape we had, man. 
Remember them things when you get done watching VCR, you plug it in and it rewind it for you? Man, ain't that fancy? I remember, brother, money, honestly, I think my, my boys might have watched the movie Hoosiers five or six hundred times. I'm sure they probably did. I know Brandon was watching it because as soon as he'd get done watching it, he'd be outside playing basketball every time he watched that thing. I don't regret tonight. I'm not being arrogant. I'm not scolding you. I'm just telling you that was such an important decision. And by the way, it wasn't that I was some super pious, pharisaical, you know, uh, legalist. Hey, listen, we had, a, we had a family conference, Brother Charles, every year in our church for about 10 years. And Dr. Alan Jones came and preached that for most of those years, and it was one of those early conferences, Brother Jones said. If you plan on raising godly children, you've got to limit the access the devil has to them. And he listed the ways the devil gets our children, puts a hunger and a thirst in their hearts for things that are not godly. And I didn't even need him to say it. I was already convicted, but he talked about that old television. Hey, listen, I know it's quiet. But it's hard enough to raise godly children in the day and age which we live if we got all of our ducks in a row. Now, I'm, boy, I shouldn't keep going. I'm, I stopped preaching and started meddling, didn't I? Amen. <laughs> Brother Brian, we probably were a little too far right, my wife and I were. I didn't have chapter and verse for every. Now, I, I know that verse that talks about setting no evil thing before your eyes, but not everything that's on television is evil. We didn't have Wii or PlayStation or Nintendo. I'm not saying any of those are evil. What my boys had was guns. They had tree forts and we got some old four-wheelers and some snowmobiles. I wanted my boys outside. I wanted my boys being boys. I don't want them. Boy, I'm going I'm to really lose some people right here. Have you ever noticed how you can't get the average kid to talk to you today because they're doing this? That boy, they're doing it at two and three years of age. I know what's, I know what's going on, Mom and Dad. That, that, pad, that little pad's a good babysitter. I know what's going on. I'd probably have had one if I was, I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying I don't want that. Brother David, I didn't want it when an adult walked up to my children that my children wouldn't make eye contact with them. I didn't want it when an adult walked up to my children and said something to my children. My children would ignore them. We would spend every night at family devotions, hundreds of times we did this, we'd have a little fun time and I'd give my kids real prize and stuff, and we, we'd practice on being polite with people. Johnny, what do you do if Brother Ken comes up to you and says, Hi, Johnny, how are you doing? Johnny would practice what he says to Brother Ken. Hi, Brother Ken. I doing good. How are you, Brother Ken? Amen. I wanted people to want to be around my kids. Not say we'd invite Debbie and Preacher over, but Three monsters. Our house isn't able to handle it. I didn't want, hey, listen, and my kids were far from and still are far from perfect, but these were the goals I had. And my decision about TV was just because I wanted to be successful and I didn't think I could be with that in my home. Good. We never had cable television. We didn't, back then, I mean, the satellite TV wasn't even thought of yet. And I'm just telling you, I, I told I was going to stop preaching and start meddling, but it was one of the best decisions we ever made. And I look back on it today, and better stop. I think I've made my point tonight. Amen. Lukewarm. Write this down tonight. This is a disgusting church. Disgusting? Yeah, look what he says in the next verse, verse 16. So... Then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. There ain't a nice way to say this. That's, that's, that's code language for vomiting. 
I do not want to be a Christian or a church that makes the God of heaven want to vomit. Can you imagine that said to any church? He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold try in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I love this phrase, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Verse 20 is such a convicting verse. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. We always use this verse as a soul winning verse. And I'm not against it because it is a good picture of the act of faith of opening one's heart to Christ. But in its purest context, this was not written to lost people. This was written to the church. God forbid tonight we come to church service after service and there's a knockout on the door and an usher comes and says, Pastor Jesus wants to know if he can come in. Yes, come on. Hey, listen. Yes, sir. I don't want Jesus on the outside of nothing in my life. I want him in the middle of everything in my life. You know this is true. I got to stop here tonight. I told myself I'd stop at 7 and it's 7.09. But as we look at all seven churches... The church at Ephesus, the loveless church. The church at Smyrna, the suffering, persecuted church. The church at Pergamos, the, the compromising church. The uh, church of Satan City. We see Thyatira, Thyatira the adulterous church. Uh, uh, the church at Sardis, the dead church. The church at Philadelphia, the faithful church. The church at Laodicea, the disgusting church. Every single one of us see ourselves in here, if we'll be honest. And my great burden tonight as we end the service. Hey, listen, you may not know this, but Jesus is coming soon. We're sitting on the front row. Talk about a, an age to live in. We are front row observers of the last few seconds of the church age. This thing's about ready to go into double overtime. And, buddy, the angels are... They're, 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 they're getting antsy, Jesus, buddy. They're, 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 they're tuning trumpets right now. They're getting, hey, listen, they're getting their shouts in order tonight. And here we are, little old church, just living our life like none of this was going on. What are we going to do this week? What are we going to do next week? What are we going to do for vacation this summer? Nothing wrong with planning, but please tell me that ain't the main stuff you're thinking about. Buddy, we are, we are living, we have front row seats to the great events of the prophetic timetable. Here's what I want to do tonight. I want to be right, and I want to be ready. Amen. Almost every single church's letter ends with the word somewhere in the end verse about overcoming. I want to be an overcomer. I want to overcome addictions. I want to overcome limitations. I want to overcome obstacles. I want to overcome. I want to overcome. I don't, hey, when Jesus comes, listen, if you and I knew that we only had a couple more weeks till he came, we could live good for a couple weeks. Amen. We could make that phone call. We could make those visits. We could get things right if we knew we had a couple of weeks. Well, let me just give you some advanced news tonight. You probably only got a couple. That's the way he wants us to live. Amen. That's the way he wants us to think. Even Paul thought he was going to come in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Paul said, we which are alive and remain at the coming. Paul thought Jesus was coming back in his lifetime. He was off about 1,950 years. <laughs> but Paul was thinking the right way. Amen. Since we don't know when he's coming, we got to live like it could be any day. Right. We're going to start of course, next Sunday night, we're going to be blessed with having Brother Scott here. But when we come back to this part of our study, we're going to launch into the tribulation period. And it's going to get the real heavy prophecy starts in our next study. But chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, 
Let me fill in the blank for you, and I won't teach it tonight. We'll just end right here. We have the rapture of the church. Right on the heels of the church age, Jesus comes back for his church. Look there at chapter 4. Let me just read it in conclusion tonight. After this, that means after the church age, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were, I love this, of a what? Trumpet. Talked with me which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And the old throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. I, I know we've lived all of our Christian life hearing this talked about. Hearing this preached about. I remember Brother Rob going to a meeting at the Jackson County Fairgrounds in the 1970s, my hometown, 10,000 people in the grandstands, and Dr. Jack Van Nippy was preaching. It was a citywide crusade on prophecy, and the title of the message that night, Brother Rob, was The Coming War with Russia. That was in the 1970s. My brother Dave who every week of the world goes into the Southern Michigan State Prison in Jackson, Michigan and preaches over 200 men. Dave got up out of his seat that night and ran down the altar and got gloriously born again. Hearing Dr. Jack Van Impey preach the coming war with Russia. You know what woke my brother up that night? I believe it was the Holy Ghost. I believe it was conviction, but let me tell you what it was. It was knowing Jesus was coming soon. Now, some of you were thinking in your heart, well, he probably should have held out if he'd have known it was going to be this long. <laughs> you ain't going to convince my brother that would have been a good choice. Amen. Now, listen. If Paul thought he was coming, and Jack and Empey thought he was coming, and they've both been in heaven a long time now, can you even imagine on the prophetic clock how close we must be tonight to the final hour? I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I think about this often when people get saved. Somebody is going to be the last convert. Somewhere on the planet, someone's going to say, dear Jesus, I come repenting of my sins. I want to be saved. And all of a sudden, da -da -da -da! trumpet's going to sound. And they're going to be a shout from glory like we ain't never heard in this world. Hey, listen. And graveyards all over Johnson County are going to turn into empty holes. And people are going to be shooting up out of the seats of their cars, the airplanes, their desks, their offices, their homes all over the world as Jesus returns for his bride. I want to be unashamed when that happens. I don't want to say, oh, God, have mercy. I wasn't ready. Oh, not today. Please, not today. I got to get some things fixed with some people. Let's just stand. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. Y'all have been great. We haven't always had an invitation every week, but I really think we need to have one tonight. Hey, listen, the church age is coming to an end. And as John said, we're going to hear a trumpet talking. I want to be ready, don't you? I want to be moving. I don't want to be stalled. I don't want to have a name that I live, but it, it, it really the reality is I'm dead. I want to be on fire for God. People told me when I first got saved, I was, I was always intense. And when I first got saved, people said, you'll calm down. By the grace of God, I ain't bragging tonight, but I have not calmed down, and it's been 45 or 44 years now. I ain't calming down. I'm, I want to be more on fire for God tomorrow than I was yesterday. Let's just take a few minutes tonight in church. Let's do some getting ready. We don't know if this is the week or not. We got share -a planned this week. We might not have share -a We might have rapture -thon. Hey, I want to live 
like I'm anticipating is coming this week. If I need to make some phone calls, if I need to witness to people, if I need to make some wrongs right, I want to do it this week. Hey, time is too short. Eternity is too long. Hey, Debbie and I had lunch today with a precious young couple. They're here tonight. And one of the things they said to us is how excited they were. They want to get involved in the church. Want to be busy. <laughs> Shame on us have been here for decades. And people that just got here are more excited about what God's doing here than we are. My dear precious friend, no matter how good or bad your past is, focus on the future. Some of you don't have a bad past. you got a good past. But focus on the future. Don't start every conversation with I used to. We used to. tonight about television but don't get caught up on the the word television get caught up on being connected to God I'm sure a kid can grow up in a family that's got a television and turn out good the problem is it's one of many things that replaces a connection to God if we're not careful I had a Wednesday, I, this, and probably a lot of you had the same problem. And has this been an allergy season for the ages or what? And some of you old timers in North Carolina may say, you ain't tough preachers, ain't nothing. Well, I'm going to tell you, I ain't tough. Man, I, I got enough allergy problems already. And man, it's been, I've been, by the grace of God, I've made it through this allergy season. And on Wednesday, man, I was coughing and hacking all night. My wife was mad. She didn't hardly sleep because of me. And she said, you're going to the doctor today. I said, okay, I'll go to the doctor today. And I went, and sure enough, they said, you got a good, good old-fashioned, I mean, intense sinus infection. They gave me an old Z-Pack, and I've been, every day this week, I've been getting a little bit better, and I'm, I feel pretty good tonight. I'm, I'm the, I finished my antibiotics today. But I've got enough history of hay fever and that kind of stuff that I, I've, I have some severe allergy and asthma kind of problems that manifest themselves once in a while in my life. And I was, I was starting, I was doing a lot better, Brother Todd, the other night, but I was still, you know, the heavy drainage and stuff, and it was drying up, but it was still, it was still there a little bit. And I was laying in bed, and, and I, it, if you ever had any asthma kind of things, you all know what I'm talking about. I, I sort of started, I mean, I was right on the verge of panic. I couldn't breathe. I was. Do, you ever done that where you're, you're drawing in them real deep breaths and they don't seem like they're satisfying you? 
And I mean, Debbie's already asleep. I spent about five or six minutes roaming the, just walking around the house trying to catch my breath. It was right on the verge of panic a little bit, Brother Money. And I made it through the night by the grace of God. It wasn't serious, but it just some of my DNA. But I got thinking about that while I was getting my heart ready for night service, trying to figure out a closing. And I didn't give it to you, but in the invitation, the Lord told me to give it to you. That's how we get ready for the Lord's return. Where we need God so bad and the eternal is so present in our minds, we just can't live without Him. We can't live without being close. We can't live without knowing everything's okay with us, me and God. And every breath the other night, Brother Ken, was precious to me. I know Joe battles with this a little bit. And just being able to open up those sacks in your lungs and be able to get an adequate supply of oxygen in there. You, some of you never had no problems like that. You don't know. It, it's scary when you literally don't know if you're going to be able to breathe. I'll promise you we'll all end up in the right mind plus that and we'll be far more ready to meet the Lord this coming week than we've ever been. If we hunger after God like I was hungering after oxygen a couple of days ago. Let me ask you a question tonight. I, this is a very unusual. I didn't ask the deacons or anybody because it just came to my attention for the service. But I found out, I, I don't have liberty to tell you who it is, but I found out that there was a family in our church that ain't got no groceries. I mean, they ain't got nothing. And I found out about it this afternoon. And uh, they haven't said nothing to me about it. But I found out about it, and I said, Darren, I ain't no way I'm going home and making me no, no, no sandwich tonight at the house. If there's somebody I know that ain't sure if they're going to be able to feed their kids. And so I want to do something. Like this. These people don't know this. It might even be, I don't think they'll be upset, but I, I think they, would, they might be disappointed if I told people who they were. But I just felt like it'd be the will of God tonight if we took up a love offering for a family in our church. Somebody that I've been dealing with quite a bit of late, and uh, some good things are happening. I, they're trending in the right direction, and their their walk with the Lord and all that. The uh, they're not in this condition because they're bad people at all. They just they they've run into a tough situation, and so let's do something for them tonight. Would you do that if it's a hundred bucks comes in or five hundred bucks comes in or whatever tonight? I just would love to be able to call them and uh, say, hey. Where y'all going to be tomorrow? We, we got something we want to give you. And it wasn't out of the budget. I debated that. I know our deacons got good enough hearts. And they'd say, just take it out of the budget, preacher. But I felt like it needed to come from us. So the uh, Brother Money, pray for us tonight. Let's, uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to ask the ushers just to be, they're going to be at the exit doors. We'll do it that I'm way Pastor tonight. Pastor Jenkins here. Here's Fellowship Baptist Church. Thank you for watching today's service here at Fellowship. I've been praying that the message would speak to your heart. We would love to help you further. If you need someone to pray with you, you need someone to pray for you, and maybe you have a spiritual need that today's service brought to light, there are several ways that you can reach out to us, enabling us to try to help you today. First of all, you could call us. Our church phone number is 919-553-6789. That number one more time is 919-553-6774. Just leave a message on the answer machine and we will get back to you as soon as possible. You can also reach out to us by going to our church webpage, which is fellowshipbaptist.com. When you go to that page, you're going to see in our quick link section a button that says more. That button, if you click that, will lead you to a prayer request link. And fill out the section there that tells us what your need is, tell us who you are, and uh, give us an email address, and we will respond to you as soon as possible. I'm so thankful that you chose to be a part of our worship service today here at Fellowship Baptist Church. 
We'd love you to sometime, when your schedule allows, to visit us in person. Our church is located at 204 Atkinson Street here in Clayton, North Carolina. I'm praying for God's richest blessings upon you and your family. Again, thank you for being a part of our service today.